So hello, museum families, and welcome to our RBCM at Home Kids, a play date through screens across British Columbia and the world. The previous sessions are recorded, and you can find them on our Royal BC Museum YouTube page. My name is Chris O'Connor, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. The museum and my home is on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here in Victoria on Vancouver Island. I am an uninvited guest and grateful to live, learn, and raise a family on this land. And today in particular, I'm thinking of my dear friend, Songhees elder Sethlema, Joan Morris. Sethlema went to Cooper Island Residential School and Nanaimo Indian Hospital, and I'm grateful to know her and continually learn from and with her. So today is September 30th, it's Orange Shirt Day, where we wear orange to honor the indigenous children that were forced to leave their home to go to residential schools. This history can make us feel sad, angry, upset, and those are all appropriate emotions to have. Learning the truth is the first step of this journey, and the best way to learn is to listen to those who have experienced this firsthand. And today we'll meet Eddie Charlie, a residential school survivor, and his friend Kristen Spray. We are so grateful to have them here today to share, and we are glad you are on the other end of the screen today to listen and learn with open hearts. In this format, you'll see me, your host, and our special guests. Today, we, as I said, it's Eddie and Kristen, though it's a webinar and Facebook Live, so we can't see you. But we can hear from you if you're using the Q&A box or the question section or the comment section on Facebook Live. So please ask questions as we go along. And we are recording this session. So if you need to take a break or you need time to, to chat, you can just play it again later. The most important thing is to take care of yourself and each other. So let's meet our uh, special guest today on this most special and important day. First, I'd like to introduce Eddie Charlie. Eddie is a member of Cowichan Nation, a former student of Cooper Island Residential School, and a graduate of Indigenous Studies at Camilson College. He is joined by Kristen Spray. After attending the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Vancouver in 2013, Kristen was motivated to enroll in the Indigenous Studies program at Camilson College. It was in this program where Eddie and Kristen met and became friends. Together, they have worked to raise awareness about residential schools and honor survivors and their families. So welcome, Eddie and Kristen. We're so happy that you're here. Thank you for having us. Um, so first off, I, there, I know a lot of people on the other end of the screen will know about Orange Shirt Day, but for those who are less familiar with Orange Shirt Day, can you give us a little sense of what this where this day started and, and why it was so important to start it and, and the movement to continue every year. It's my understanding that uh, Phyllis Webstead uh, experienced this in her childhood, having her orange shirt taken uh, after her grandmother gave it to her and she went to her first day of residential school. And uh, those feelings of feeling like she didn't matter from her experience and time spent at residential school, traveled with her uh, for many years until she started her healing journey and started sharing more publicly about uh, uh, how she felt and how she felt about that color. And uh, a good friend of hers, Joan Sorley, had come up with the idea of having an orange shirt day uh, ceremony to acknowledge and remember, honor residential school survivors and those who didn't. And that's my understanding of how things started and they had their first Orange Shirt Day ceremony in 2013 in Williams Lake. And then the two of you here in Victoria uh, were interested in, in raising awareness as well. Can you, can you talk a little bit about uh, your journey together? To, to bring awareness within, within Victoria. I want to share about our journey of raising awareness about Orange Shirt Day in Victoria. Um, as Kristen mentioned, um, we first started um, the idea of creating awareness about the effects of residential school 
while we were students at Commotion College. Um, I had some fears initially about wanting to come out of um, my um, safe place and talking about my own experience as a um, residential school survivor because I had fears that um, I would trigger some old feelings that I fought so hard to forget. And so when Kristen initially asked me if, if I would work with her to create awareness about um, residential school, I um, did not have the courage to answer. And she kept pressuring me over a whole year to, um, to walk with her and help her um, create an uh, understanding about what residential school did to students that went there. Mm -hmm. And I was too scared. But one day while we were at Commotion College, I was in the library and I overheard some people talking about um, residential school and I felt a little bit outraged that they felt that not much harm happened to children that were in residential school because really the first act of harm was having 150,000 children taken away from their homes and then isolated from their parents and their grandparents and their families places where they first learned their language, their culture and tradition. Having that isolation was the first part of destruction of um, their language and their identity. So I was very upset when I heard people say that not much damage was done, done to um, students that went to residential school. And this is just one part of it. Children were physically abused while they were in the schools for speaking their own language and for singing songs that they grew up with, so songs that they learned from the grandparent, songs that were passed down from generation to generation and survived thousands of years. And um, I was just like, this story needs to be shared. So the next time Kristen asked me if I would work with her, I said, yes, I, I will work with you. So the, First year we had a word shirt day, I was a little bit nervous and shocked at the response that we got. And I thought there would be like 40, maybe 50 people at our event. But when over 200 people came to our first event, it really, it was a really um, turning point for me. It changed my thinking and I wanted to do more. And I was really grateful to Kristen for asking me to work with her. So I started doing research about how much was known about residential school. And most of the history about residential school comes from people that went to residential school. There are no written books about residential school survivors and there's no history written about the effects of residential school. Um, and the little books that I do see out there, they don't do justice to what really happened to the children that were in the school. So a lot of children were um, taken away from their homes when they were four and a half years old. And they spent 10 years in residential schools. And so it's hard to try to explain to people the exact kind of damage that children experience when they're in the school where they face discrimination, physical abuse, starvation, and um, sex abuse from uh, people that were in that school to take care of us and teach us. But instead, we were experiencing trauma. And we took that trauma home with us when we eventually returned home to our communities. And we created a um, destruction of our um, our culture and our community even more than what happened when we first um, got removed from our homes. And I think that was the intention of our residential school to remove us from our home and slowly destroy our culture and identity. And I think that's what Duncan Campbell Scott really wanted was to destroy the indigenous um, culture and identity we want all of Canada to understand this, that 
it's not just that mm -hmm. children were taken away from their homes and abused, but the effect that these children had when they returned home, we influenced uh, another generation of um, alcoholism and drug addiction, violence, and we want people to understand this, not just non-Indigenous, but Indigenous people, so that when we have this dialogue, we learn to understand what happened to us in residential school. It's not our fault. And we can receive ownership of ourselves when we learn how to walk in a safe place, share our stories in gentle ways, and begin to understand and work on the trauma that we all experienced as children. And I believe that by doing this, we help our um, siblings who didn't go to residential school. We help our parents and the grandparents who had to stand by helplessly as we were taken away from our homes and placed in a residential school. And it is my hope that we inspire um, a new generation of uh, speakers uh, to help each other. And I think we are doing that. It takes a lot of work. And people talk about reconciliation and what does it look like? And I just wanted to say that reconciliation is not about an apology or um, trying to fix things. Reconciliation should be about recognizing that there are unique cultures on these lands, different cultures that um, we, might, we might not understand, but we need to respect that. If we can learn to respect that, I believe that we can all walk in equal ways, use our voices in equal ways, and create unity that's been missing from these lands for a long time. And I just want to acknowledge that we are here on the Lekwungen, um people's lands. And I want to acknowledge the people from Lekwungen and I raise my hands to um, the people of Lekwungen for allowing us to speak here. And I also want to say that on these lands, there are many survivors of residential schools still walking among us. And me and Kristen want to raise our hands to those that are residential school survivors. And we say thank you for your resiliency, your courage, and your strength. Keeping our culture alive by talking with um, your children and grandchildren, that means a lot to me as a survivor of residential school. And um, I just want to express my gratitude to all the survivors, whether they went to residential school or they were, whether they're intergenerational survivors and I just want to thank everybody in Canada who put on an orange shirt day today, today to help us honor the residential school survivors and their families. Um, in a residential school, there were 4,000 children who died and 2,000 children that are still not accounted for. And we want to remember that today. We want to honor those families that um, experience that trauma of losing their children and never known the full story about what happened to their children while they were students at um, residential schools in Canada. And we hope by sharing all of Canada will come together and help us acknowledge the effects of residential school, not just on students like myself who went to residential school, but what we took home and transmitted our community, our families, and that one day we'll all be able to stand together and talk in an equal way. So me and Kristen, we want to say um, thank you very much for having us here today, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Eddie and Kristen, for, for being here. Um, and I was, I was thinking, Eddie, as you were um, really appreciate your honoring the residential school survivors of Songhees and Esquimalt nations that walk among us here. Um, and also I was thinking about 
uh, started to talk about reconciliation, I'm just thinking back to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Mary Sinclair and that the importance of that in terms of creating safe space for survivors to safely tell their story, um, to not do further harm to themselves, um, and then to get the truth of that experience out um, in a way that allows both the healing to happen for those that went through that, but also the openness for people to actually hear and receive those stories, the, not stories, but the, the truth. Um, so, uh, so, I, so and, you, and then you were also talking about intergenerational harm. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to that, just how how the the impact of like a, a, a child being at a residential school can have that impact across generations, that harm across generations, and how does the healing happen from from that the the, the how that intergenerational uh, harm? Um, Chris is asking about intergenerational trauma. And how is it it carries on from one generation to another? And then how is it possible for there to be healing? Um, I don't know if people really understand how trauma works and how it's transmitted through um, the generations. But um, if people ever walk in a hospital and they he's, they walk to the baby ward and you see one baby crying and and this one baby's hurting. All the other children will respond to that and um, they'll pick up that emotional um, pain from the child and they all start crying. What happened in our community is similar to that experience. Um, I think for my harm, I, I passed it on to my siblings who didn't go to residential school. But there's also the other issue about intergenerational trauma is um, it's really hard to explain something really dark like this. Um, I have parents and grandparents that went to residential school. I went to residential school and I have relatives the same age as me that went to um, residential school and what I mean by intergenerational harm is what my dad experienced in residential school he learned that and he took it home and he started to uh, take his anger and frustration out on us and then when we come home from residential school we took our harm and our pain with us too and we started taking it out on other people. And it just kept on going down and down and down until everybody in one household where they had residential school survivors like my parents, they took their anger and frustration out on people from, from the pain they experienced in residential school and then in, and in hurt people around them. That's one part of intergenerational trauma. And then there's um, the second generation of um, family that went to residential school. We passed that on to our sibling, our, our own children, and, and our grandchildren. And that harm that we gave to them, it flowered out, it expanded, and um, it got worse as uh, we passed it down. And, I, I certainly see that in um, how um, my children and my um, nephews and nieces are um, behaving in community. They, they carry that aggression that I had in me, that my, my parents had in them. And they're very, um, they're very aggressive in the community and how they relate to people. That's a, a part of intergenerational trauma. We taught our ge uh, next generation how to be as bad as we are. They, um, 
live off of our trauma and it sort of became their own. So it really hard to explain completely and in in a way people can understand it in layman's terms about psychology. But the best description I can give you is when a person puts their hand in the water and then they touch somebody else and that water drips down onto um, Kristen, not only am I wet from the water, but Kristen becomes wet too. So the harm that I took home from residential school, when I touch somebody around me, they experience that same pain and trauma. And I want people to um, feel safe to talk about it because uh, I just want to say that it's unprecedented this um, experience of residential school. And it happened over 150 years. So we have like all these generations of families that experience residential school. And um, we don't know how to deal with something like this. We're not trained um, psychologists. But on top of that, residential school stole something from us that ability to function as family, the ability to function as parents, that we had no role models to teach us how to, um, to um, teach our children to walk in gentle ways. And I, I honestly hope that by what we do today, that we will learn how to um, take care of our community in a kind, gentle way too. And we will pass that on to um, our children and grandchildren. Because if there can be intergenerational um, trauma, maybe there can also be intergenerational healing. Mm -hmm. That's what I was imagining when you were talking about the, the water dripping into someone else's hand of harm, that also could be water of healing too dripping off. And I feel like the the two of you and so many others are are giving space for that kind of healing. Thank you for saying that. What there is, uh, yeah, oh, go ahead. Things coming to mind, and I I hope it's okay that I I ask Eddie this or kind of prompt this. But just the when when we say residential school, um, I think for myself growing up, I have a certain understanding of what school is. And I think um, there's a, um, a lot more to be looked at in terms of what residential schools were in terms of school or schooling. So I wondered if you could expand on that, Eddie, about residential schools and what, what was it a school? Were they teaching you? Um, well, I think, um, there's a quote in, um, in a history book surrounding residential school and Duncan Campbell Scott said that um, we have to get rid of the Indian problem. And um, so residential schools were basically created to um, assimilate indigenous people into mainstream society so that they could end the, um, the um, culture of indigenous people. So, while we were in the residential school, I don't really remember being taught that much. Mostly we did a lot of work and, and they forced us to go to church a lot. And so I remember a lot of um, quotes from the Bible and events that happened in the Bible. But we didn't learn things like math, English, science or history. And so when I got out of residential school and placed back into the community, I was less um, educated and um, articulate than my um, peers. And I always felt like um, it wasn't good enough. And I think part of that not was, was not only that they weren't teaching us, but the teachers and the dorm supervisors constantly loomed over us and said things like, 
you're a stupid in you. You'll never be nothing but a stupid in you. And today, those words still ring deep in my heart and inside my head. And I always feel like I don't have as much confidence. And I think that's the only reason why I find the courage to do what we do. Resident Field School was not really a school. It was more like, uh, we're the apprentice, the residential school students to be uh, of harm careers in, into their community. They taught us how to hate our culture, how to hate our identity, how to hate our language. And when we went in the community, we taught everybody else how to do that too. And I, I wanted to point out that a um, hundred years ago, there were over um, 240 indigenous languages spoken in um, what's now known as Canada. And, and today there are a lot less. And um, I'm not sure how, much, how many languages are still spoken in Canada, but um, 150 years ago, um, there were more ing indigenous languages spoken on these lands than there was English. And now English is the um, dominant language. And every day, one indigenous language is dying. And um, so I think residential school had a lot of um, success in similarness. And, um, killing off our identity and our belief that we mattered. So there was teaching going on, but like learning that no child should ever have to learn. So, um, there is a one question from a a school, a grade eight class from Brent, Brentwood College, Daryl Stevens class, says, what can we do to help to make things better, to help heal the, the healing process? There's a question from the school at Brentwood College. What can we do to help things get better? Um, I, I'm always ask that question, and I still struggle with that um, every day. Um, I'm just reminded um, of um, teaching my grandfather, and um, he told me a story about the river, and then, um, I'm sure people heard me explain this about how we must treat the river the same way we treat our spirit. If you throw something bad into the river, it has the effect of destroying things along the way. And you can say the same thing about your spirit. If you throw bad things into your spirit, like alcohol, violence, or negative feeling, you have a way of destroying other things down along your path, like relationships with people, with your family, the people in the community. And until we clean up that river, we'll always be stuck in that bad place. So my suggestion is, uh, you need to listen to the stories of our residential school survivors. They are walking, talking, history books of what happened in residential school. There are no records about um, what happened to residential school um, students. And teachers and priests and dorm supervisors and nuns, they were all not monitored. So they pretty much did everything, whatever they wanted to do. So my suggestion is they need to hear these stories of residential school survivors and try not to judge them and try not to offer ways they can heal. When you listen to them and um, hear their stories, I think the people that went to residential school when they start speaking and people listen respectfully to their stories, 
these students um, that went to residential school feel um, like validated and they feel um, that they found a place of belonging. And I certainly have started to feel that. The more I go out in the community and share, the easier it is for me to begin speaking to people. And I'm hoping that um, by doing this, I inspire uh, other people to start speaking the same, same way and sharing their own experiences. So the best suggestion I have is to, to, to listen and take what you hear from residential school survivors and share it with other people without um, changing any, any of the story so that uh, slowly all, all of Canada will begin to understand that, yes, we were hurt in residential school, and yes, we are still hurt today, and we want to change that. And we hope by sharing our story that we can do that. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you for that. Um, we're at 11.30, so what I'm gonna do is we'll just do an of official goodbye in case there's any classes that need to go or any families that need to go at this point. But then we'll stay on for a few minutes um, for any questions. There's one question from a grade four student from Richmond, so I wanna ask that to you, but I'll, I'll first, um, so if you're, if that school from Richmond, hold on a few minutes. Um, but I did want to just as, as we close, officially close, just say that we had comments from Facebook Live. Uh, Kurt says, thank you for sharing your story. Priya says, wonderful sharing here. Uh, we have another one. Thank you for sharing your story with us and helping us understand more about such a difficult time for so many. Uh, Jennifer on Facebook says, thank you so much for sharing and speaking, Eddie. Um, and Carolyn says, thank you for sharing, Eddie. A lot of appreciation for, um, it's, uh, I could only imagine uh, it's not easy to share. Um, so I, we really honor the, that act of sharing and, and appreciate your, your courage to, to do that. So, um, so for just officially, uh, and I also think Eddie and Kristen, just like the act of sharing and supporting that the two of you really model that so well, that it's, it's hard to share and to have someone beside you to support is, is a really beautiful thing to witness as well. So I really value the, the, what you both are doing uh, through this process. So if anyone needs to leave, um, we, we thank you for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll stay on Facebook Live and we'll stay on Zoom just for a little while longer to ask some questions. The first question, Eddie and, um, and Kristen,